It's Barbara, and we are talking epistemology today. We have now moved into the area of what is called epistemology. Epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge. What is knowledge? Is knowledge secure? Where does it come from? How do we define it? These are all epistemological questions. And you have two essays in this checklist this week. The first essay is Appearance and Reality by Bertrand Russell. And we'll be using him from steps one through four. And then we have DC Phillips, which is going to be the opposing viewpoint, the flaw, which is in step five. So, hopefully you watch the documentary because I'm going to make references to the documentary, uh, Brain Games, that I put as a link online. If you didn't, I would suggest you watch the first 15, 20 minutes of it just to get the gist of it because it will help you to not only understand the essays better but to see why it matters. So our philosophical question this week is, is there any knowledge that is so certain that no reasonable person could doubt it? That's our question. Is there any piece of knowledge that you know without a doubt you would bet your life on it? There's no if ands or buts, there's no doubt whatsoever. You know it 100%. It is absolute knowledge. That's our question. Well, in step two, where we normally define terms, there's some terms we need to define, but we also need to talk more about our question. So what terms do we need to define? Well, sensation is the feeling of using your senses. Uh, I see a book. The feeling of the of seeing the book is the sensation. The information I get from the sensation, it's rectangular, Mindy says exploring ethics on it. This is all sense data. Sense data is the information you receive from your sensations. And sensations are the feelings you get from your five senses. Um, epistemology, like we said earlier, is the philosophical study of knowledge. And logical inference, because we're going to use it for Bertrand Russell's argument, is think back to when we did logic. It's your ability to, to make a logical inference. So if premise one says all men are bald, premise two says Socrates is a man, we can make the logical inference from those two statements that Socrates is bald. Because if those two statements are true, that's the inference, okay? Now, the last thing we're going to talk about before we move on is what does it mean to say, is there any absolute knowledge? Well, where does our knowledge come from? Think about all the information in your head that you basically walk around the world and this is the information you have that you think is correct or is correct, it doesn't matter. So you have a head full of knowledge, all right? Where does your knowledge come from? Well, it comes from your experiences, and your experiences are made up of your sensations, your five senses. When we walk around in the world, we are entirely dependent on our five senses for our experience of life. What you've Feel, see, touch, hear. Which one did I miss? See, hear, touch, feel, taste. All right, you have five senses, and your experience of the world is directly coming from your five senses. You know that you're listening to this video because you're seeing it and hearing it. You know, even if it's something you read, well, you still need it, your eyesight to read the book so you know whatever it is you read. You function in this world based on your five senses. Your experiences are made of your five senses. Your knowledge comes from your experiences, so you only have reliable knowledge if you have reliable senses. So then the question becomes, can you trust the evidence of your senses? So when we started off asking the question, is there any reliable knowledge? What we've come down to is our senses reliable because our knowledge is coming from our senses. So that is the question we're asking. 
Now we move on. Step three. Bertrand Russell. Can you trust the evidence of your senses? Is there any knowledge in the world so certain no person reasonable no reasonable person could doubt it? No. According to Bertrand Russell, no. You cannot trust the evidence of your senses 100%. There is not 100% certainty for any knowledge you have. Bertrand Russell is a famous skeptic. Skeptics and philosophies are those philosophers who believe you should have a small doubt for everything. There's nothing in this world that's absolute. There's a small bit of doubt to everything. You could literally be wrong about everything. And you should admit there's a small possibility you could be wrong about everything you know. That's the position of a skeptic. He's not suggesting you don't sit down in the chair because the chair may not exist. He's saying you should recognize that there's a small percentage, small possibility you could be wrong about literally everything. So why does he think this? All right. Before we deal with examples from the video, think about it. How often are your senses wrong? You walk down the street, you see a friend you know, you wave at them, they turn, that's not your friend. You're riding down the road, you see a puddle butt in front of you, you slow down, it turns out to be dry ice. Um, you smell, I don't know, watermelon. You take a bite and it tastes like cantaloupe. I don't know why that would happen, but I'm thinking of examples here. So, your senses get the wrong, you get the wrong information from your senses on a regular basis. So based on that alone, it throws your knowledge into doubt. So think about it. The knowledge in your head, imagine all the knowledge in your head, all right, is a bowl of marbles. And each marble is a representation of the piece of knowledge you have. Now, I point to a, piece, a marble and I say, how sure are you that this is a marble? It looks like a marble, it feels like a marble, it works like a marble, it's a marble. So you say, I'm sure this is a marble 100%. And I'm like, all right. Now, imagine this bowl of marbles. And one of those marbles is not really a marble. It looks like a marble. It's the shape of a marble. It can work as a marble. But inside the marble is really a... machine. So it's not really a marble. It has the appearance of a marble, but it's reality. In reality, it's a time machine. Now, look at that bowl of marbles again. I point to a marble. I say, what is that? You say, it's a marble. I say, how sure are you that that's a marble? And you think about it and you think, hmm, well, there's a thousand marbles in this bowl. One of those marbles is not a marble. I don't know which marble is not a marble, so I can't say for certain, 100% certainty, that that marble is a marble. So I'm gonna say I'm 99.9% .9 certain that that marble is a marble. But there's that one-tenth of a per percentage that it's not. Now take this analogy and imagine it's the knowledge in your head. If your knowledge is based on your senses, and sometimes your senses get the wrong information. Does it throw some of your knowledge into doubt, or all of your knowledge into doubt? According to Bertrand Russell, it throws all of your knowledge into doubt. The same way that that bowl of marbles, you're only 99% certain, 99.9% .9 certain it's a marble, because you know one of those marbles isn't a marble. You just don't know which one it is. Now imagine your head, it's full of knowledge, but you know that some of that knowledge is wrong, but you don't know which one's wrong. Because if you walk down the sidewalk and you see your friend and it really wasn't your friend, will you ever know it? No, but that little piece of knowledge in your head says, I passed my friend on the sidewalk today. That knowledge is wrong. 
but you won't know it's wrong. So if there's pieces of information in your head that's wrong and you don't know which one's wrong, it throws all of the knowledge in your head a little bit into doubt. That's Bertrand Russell's position. He's going to have two positions. Well, two related ideas. One, he's going to say, no, there is no absolute knowledge. He's going to say this first part that we've covered because your senses can give you the wrong information and do, it throws all of your knowledge into doubt. All right. Now, the second part of his answer is basically not only does the fact that our senses can be deceived lead us to question all our knowledge, but we are not directly tied to reality. The name of the essay is Appearance and Reality. So what's the difference between the appearance of something and the reality of that something? The reality is a reference to the truth of the matter. Whatever the truth of the matter is, that's the reality of something. The appearance of something is what it appears to be. This appears to be a water bottle. It is, feels like a water bottle, smells like one, there's water in it, it's a water bottle. Alright, so now, the appearance of this it is a water bottle. So how do our minds work? And this is how it's tied into the documentary you saw. My mind looks at this bottle, and or I see it, and my mind interprets that feeling, that taste, that look, it's water bottle. So our mind makes a logical inference from the appearance of something to the reality of that thing. And for Bertrand Russell, this is how it works. So if that's the way it works, we are not, we are living in the appearance of the world, not the reality of the world. Think in terms of the documentary. On the very first example, there's two gray boxes. You know the reality of the situation is those two gray boxes are exactly the same color gray boxes. But when, your mind, when you see it, your mind interprets it for you. Because they drew a little white line at the top of the second box, your mind says, hey, that represents the fact that the bottom box should be in shadow. So when you look at that, those two boxes, it looks like two different colored grays. Why? Well, the boxes are exactly the same color, but your mind interprets this, the bottom box as a lighter color because the white line tells it it should be in shadow. So your mind takes in the information from the sensory inputs, interprets it, and makes a logical inference about the reality of the situation from the appearance of the situation. You see the two boxes, your mind makes a logical inference based on that white line that the bottom box is in shadow so it should be lighter. So you see two different colored gray boxes regardless of what the reality of the situation is because your mind interpreted it that way and it feeds you what it thinks the reality is. So your mind is kind of I don't know. I think it's kind of exciting, but a little creepy too. Your mind can make you feel, see, see things that are not actually there. And when you cover the white line on, you will see the exact same color gray boxes. If you haven't watched the documentary, I highly recommend it. Um, so what happens if you get conflicting sensory inputs? All right. The example, about, I don't know, it's about 30 minutes into the documentary. There's the girl, and she's saying, and what they did is she is actually, the word ba is being said, but they took video of her saying ga, and they put, it's, she's saying ba, so the auditory is ba. But because visually she looks like she's saying ga, when you first watch the video, you can't tell what she's saying. When I listened to it, I heard la, ga, everything but ba. 
And then in the video, they have you close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, all of a sudden, you hear it correctly. She's saying, ba, ba, ba. Why does that happen? You're getting conflicting sensory inputs, all right? From your hearing, you're hearing ba. But you're seeing someone say ga. So your mind has to interpret the reality. And it, because it's getting conflicting information, it's going to go with what you see visually, because visual is usually the primary sense for most people. So even though the reality of the world is, the word ba is being said, you don't hear ba. You hear ga because your mind has interpreted it, made a logical inference from what it's seeing that what she's saying is ga. So even though the word ba is actually what's being said, you don't hear that. You hear what your mind interprets as reality. So your mind will basically feed you, based on your sensory inputs, what it thinks reality is. And the really impressive thing about Bertrand Russell is he wrote this, I have to look up the date, like 80 years before there's ever any scientific proof. He was writing what the world was like long before there was actually evidence of what he was saying. So the second part of step four you need to know is, according to Bertrand Russell, our mind makes a logical inference from the appearance of something to the reality of something. And in the essay he uses the example of the table. So, if you see it from four different perspectives, how do you know it's a table? Well, your, your mind makes a logical inference from the information to the reality of that something. I like the documentary because I think it's a lot more clear. Um, but the ones in the book work just as well. And this shows that there's a difference between the appearance of the world and the reality of that world. And that we are basically our mind is making logical inferences from the appearance of things to the reality of that thing. So if we're not in direct contact with the reality or the truth of the world, you can't know anything for 100%. You're not even directly tied to it. You're just making an inference about it. And that are the, are the main points for the Bertrand Russell Appearance and Reality essay. Anyway. I hope you watch the documentary because it makes it so much more interesting. I love Bertrand Russell um, and his ideas I think are great, but his writing can be a little dry. So I think seeing it makes a big difference. All right, so that's Bertrand Russell's position. Now we need, where's the flaw in this? Well, for that, you're gonna read DC Phillips, What Can We Know? And he is gonna disagree on both counts with Bertrand Russell. D.C. Phillips is going to say that's not really what's happening. Um, the first point that, that Russell makes is that our, our senses deceive us, that we get the wrong information. And D.C. Phillips is going to counter this and say, no, our senses are not deceiving us. It's the circumstances surrounding our, our, our sensors. So the example used in the book was, say, of a bent stick. There's a stick sticking out of the water. And you look at it, and it looks bent. So for Bertrand Russell, this would be an example of your senses deceiving you. The stick really isn't bent. It's the shadow on the stick that makes it look bent. So Phillips is going to come back and say, no. Your senses told you the right information, that it's a shadow. If you want to know if you have the correct information, you don't question your senses. You check out the circumstances surrounding them. You go look at the stick, you take the stick out of the water, and you realize it's a straight stick, and it was the shadow that was giving you the impression it was bent. He's going to argue that your senses generally work fine. And if your senses are working fine and 
there's no abnormal circumstances. There's no reason you can't trust the evidence of your senses and therefore the knowledge based on them. That if you get the wrong information, it's not your senses' fault, it's the circumstances. So then you go back to the examples from the documentary. Well, is it normal that you would hear a girl saying ba? Well, it looks like she's saying ga. Abnormal circumstance. Um, the gray boxes abnormal circumstances. All of those are abnormal circumstances. So Phillips is going to argue that if you get the wrong information, it's not because your senses are getting, being deceived. It's because the circumstances in a certain situation give you the wrong information. All right. So trust your senses. And if you want to make sure they're correct, check out the circumstances. Good circumstances, good senses, then you're good to go. You have reliable knowledge. All right, that's the first part of his response. The second part of his response, he's going to, Bertrand Russell is going to say there's a disconnection between the appearance of the world and the reality of the world, and that our minds bridge this by making an inference from the appearance of the world to the reality of the world. So, which makes our knowledge less secure because we're not directly tied to reality. Phillips is going to come back and say, you're wrong. We are directly tied to reality. So then you say, Phillips, how are you sure that we're directly tied to reality? And he's going to say, hmm, imagine, I can't remember if he used the red apple. No, he uses a harbor as an example in the essay. I'm going to use a red apple because I think it's easier. Imagine a red apple. Close your eyes, imagine. Okay, what do I imagine? I imagine the shape of an apple, which is kind of like, that's not a good shape. Roundish, uh, it's red, um, it has a little stem on top. Now, I ask you, take a minute, imagine a red apple. What do you see? You're gonna see the same thing that I saw. Why do we all imagine the same type of red apple when I say imagine a red apple? Because we all have experience with red apples. If we all didn't have experience in the real world with a real apple, we wouldn't all ex imagine the same red apple. And that's how D.C. Phillips tries to say that we are directly tied to reality. If we're going to do a step six, Bertrand Russell does not respond to Phillips because Phillips wrote this years after Russell was dead. Um, that's not a really good argument for why we're directly tied to reality. Um, we could be in the matrix and all imagine a red apple. It doesn't prove that the red apple is real. For those of you who haven't seen the original matrix, we could all live in a hologram and we could all know what a red apple is, eat red apples, but it could be a holographic red apple. Just because we all imagine the same thing doesn't actually prove that we're directly tied to reality. It means we all have an image of a holographic red apple. That would be step six. I'm not going to go too far into step six because for this particular essay, you need to know Bertrand Russell's position, Phillips' position, and how they relate. Um, epistemology, I enjoy it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the documentary. And email me if you have questions. Have a good one. Bye.